Well, welcome to A Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. And in this episode, we're going to look at the incredible life and ministry of Oral Roberts. And I pray that as we do so, the Lord God would just give us a now word from heaven regarding our purpose, that we too would step up to the plate and glorify Jesus and serve our generation. That was Oral Roberts' burden and desire, to serve his generation. He saw the world and he saw that they needed Jesus. He saw them sick and tormented by the enemy, lost without Jesus. And he knew he had to go. And he had to preach a word that was controversial in so many ways. But he lived through it. And it was a personal revelation that he got, as we'll discover. And he brought a real Jesus with real answers to real problems. And blessed not just his generation, but continues to bless this generation. Well, O. Roberts was born uh, in 1918, uh, in January. Um, before he was born, his mother, they were, his mother and father were Pentecostals. His mother was a Cherokee Indian. And his mother was asked to go pray for this young boy who was seriously ill dying. And she's on her way and she gets stuck um, in the fence. And she prays out the Lord and says, Lord, if you will heal the boy and he lives, my son will serve you all these days. And Or Roberts was dedicated to a purpose, and God had a purpose for him. Uh, he was given the name, of course, Oral, and when you think about it, from an early age, he had a problem speaking. And his mother would constantly remind him, you know, you're called to preach the gospel, and you know, he, he stuttered and he, he struggled. And the Lord said, and she reminded him, the Lord is going to heal you, and you are going to preach this gospel. Well, Oral Roberts, as I said, was part of these early Pentecostals. Uh, and, of course, they were persecuted greatly. And it made life very difficult for Oral Roberts. Uh, and he lived in Pontotoc County in Oklahoma. When he went to school, he was ridiculed, suffered greatly. And he longed for acceptance. And he started to run, in many ways, from the Lord and from the call. Uh, he became involved in the local Methodist church because he really was rebelling against his father, who was a pastor. Um, and they were in deep poverty, hated poverty. They really were in deep poverty. Well, when he was a teenager, he started to become very successful at sports. And all of a sudden, that gained him acceptance. And it's amazing, you know, if we don't pour into our children how the enemy will use things like that, acceptance, because we want to be accepted. So, Oral Roberts started to become very successful. He was very tall. And in a fulfillment of a prayer that his mother made, that he would, you know, retain certain characteristics of his heritage of being a Cherokee, um, he had a look and he was tall and he was strong. And he succeeded in sports. Uh, and his coach, anyways, left and moved to a different college uh, and invited Oral Roberts to join him. And Oral Roberts told his parents, and his parents said, no, they were against it. But he said, I'm going anyways. And they turned and said, you'll never outrun our prayers for you. And, you know, we need as parents to really lay a hold of that. Our children can never outrun our prayers. And so, Earl Roberts left, and of course, he went, he started to be successful, uh, but he starts to take ill. And during a game, he collapses, and he falls down, and he's coughing, he, blow, he coughs up blood. Well, he's taken back to his parents' home, and here he's diagnosed with TB, and it's not looking good. He's dying. He loses a lot of weight. He goes down to 120 pounds. He's struggling, uh, and the Lord is trying to get a hold of him, but he's still rebelling. And his sister comes in and says, the Lord is going to heal you. Hallelujah for people to come in with a now word, the right word. And then his brother Elmer came in and said, you know what? There's this guy who's going to crusade, a uh, healing crusade. We're going to take you to that. And so his parents gathered together. They took him to this healing crusade. And Or Roberts was instantly healed. And the doctors confirmed it. Well, so his father then went after him and said, I'm not leaving and just going to stand here praying. 
with you as he was in his bedroom recovering until you received Jesus. And he's praying, and in the midst of it, Or Roberts saw Jesus through the face of his father. And Or Roberts was dramatically changed because it was a real revelation. You know, many of our children are raised up on our revelation, and they've got to get it for themselves. They have to have a real encounter because what Or Roberts ran with was what was real to him. He had a testimony, and this now opened the door for him to go into ministry. Now he pursues the Lord and pursues ministry, and he begins traveling, preaching, and, and sharing the gospel. And in 1936, he goes forward to be ordained in the Pentecostal Holiness Movement at a camp meeting, I believe it was at Sulphur Springs. Uh, and it's at this meeting, he actually would meet Evelyn, his future wife. She's part of the worship team, and he gets to sit beside her and talk to her. Um, and they would start a relationship. Now, he also hungers and thirsts for the Holy Ghost. And that's critical to the ministry and life of, of Or Roberts, was this hunger. He had a great hunger for God. Always, God, I want more of you. And so he's desiring the Holy Ghost. And so in 1936, he would get ordained, filled with the Holy Ghost, and of course, meet his future wife. Well, now he's traveling, and of course he's preaching uh, with a greater anointing, greater effectiveness because of the Holy Ghost. And he begins to correspond and share with Evelyn, who is in Texas as a teacher, uh, regarding his ministry and his desire to serve the Lord and travel and preach the gospel. And they come of like faith. Uh, and finally he takes his mother down one weekend in 1938, and they go visit Evelyn in Texas. They drive 600 miles. Uh, and while he's there that weekend, they would end up sharing and, and really bonding, and they become engaged. They would finally be married uh, on December 24th, 1938. And they truly would be a, a couple joined together uh, that were walking in the same direction. She and amplified the gift, helped the gift, was a blessing to the gift, enabled Or Roberts to be more effective, a true helpmate from heaven so critical the right relationships that we marry the right people that bless us and amplify the gift well or roberts would now begin pastoring for the next 10 years and during that time period he would continue to go to school at nighttime because obviously he fell out of school dropped out of school because of sickness uh, and they pastor several churches including in north carolina and oklahoma but around 1947 he becomes disturbed and he starts to go after the Lord, he begins to hunger and fast, something's in him. And he gets this revelation that we're not called just to be believers in Christ, but to be followers. And that followers are those that follow after, not just those that attend church and do things in church, but those that do what Jesus did and follow after Jesus, go forth and preach and pray and heal the sick. And he saw that Jesus was broken for, this, for each generation and that what he'd done on the cross to reach the lost, the sick and diseased, and it impacted him. And he now realized that he's called to go forth and preach the healing message to his generation. And he's fully persuaded by that. And he goes, and his, of course his church see him how he's lost a lot of weight through fasting and praying. And he tells them, of what the Lord's told him and of his plan that he's going to um, rent this hall. And the hall is going to take $160, which was a whole month's salary. And they had typically 200 people turn up at service. And he's believing God that if he's truly called into this healing ministry, um, he's going to see over a thousand people turn up. They're going to meet the budget, which of course was $160. And somebody was going to be dramatically and wonderfully healed. Well, that time he also applied for a job as a salesperson at a men's clothing store. 
So Or Roberts um, turns up that night, and his people understand. They know what the fleece that he's put out. And of course, over a thousand, I think it was like 1,200 people turn up to the service. So somebody checked off. There you go. First thing checked off. And then somebody takes up a note when they arrive at over $160. I think it was $160.33. So there you go. Number two met. And then number three, somebody was dramatically and clearly healed. So Oral Roberts knows that he's called into the healing ministry. He never would go on to be that salesperson, but he would launch that day into the healing ministry. Well, he would go and preach for a Reverend Pringle, and he turns up to preach, and before he preaches, somebody uh, tries to shoot him. What would make the headlines worldwide, um, how he was almost killed, and it would launch him into almost a global ministry, the sound heard around the earth. And so Oral Roberts now begins traveling. He buys the tent that he calls the Canvas Cathedral, and it can carry about 3,000, it can hold like 3,000 people. He buys uh, chairs, fold up chairs, he gets a piano for it and everything else. And it costs, I think it's like $60,000, which you know, was an incredible amount of money at that time. And he travels throughout the country preaching the gospel of salvation and healing. And he gets a guy to work with him, Robert DeWeese. And the, the, what they set up is this, where you have to come and hear the word first. You've got to sit through an hour and a half of just being, just hearing the word because he believes strongly on building everything on a foundation of the Word. And then afterwards, you would be given a, a prayer card that you could go then and enter the prayer line. Uh, there would be a room for the seriously sick, and then the rest would come and he would pray afterwards. So he would go to the seriously sick first, and then they would pray for the generals, generalist people. So Oral Roberts would do this, um, and of course, we're right now in the middle of the healing revival that broke out in 1948 and went into the 50s. So O. Roberts, um, his ministry takes off. People start writing to him, and O. Roberts is, is broken and burdened to respond. He, his heart is for the people. He sees them, and you see throughout, you know, he's just really hurt and broken for the people. And he, he's sincere. There's some behind the scenes. He does pray, and he wants to respond to all these letters. Well, soon the letters keep increasing, so he turns his garage into his office, and he has volunteers helping to respond to these letters. Uh, but it keeps growing. And this man, Lee Braxton, hears about it, comes and invites him to a meeting in Florida. Would then go and see his garage and sees this and says, you know, no, 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 this is, this is not going to work. And they, he's, he would sponsor him. They open up an office. Um, and it would become the headquarters for Oral Roberts Ministry. He would start a newsletter, um, Healing Waters, that would later on become Abundant Life. But now he's more able to connect with his people. Um, and he would also then connect with Gordon Lindsay, of course, who was part of William Branham's uh, ministry team. And they would get an agreement together where they shared itineraries. Um, and there's a picture, of course, with Or Roberts and the William Branham team. Or Roberts now travels throughout the country uh, preaching this message. And in 1950, um, he is invited to go to visit an, uh, a Billy Graham crusade and up in Washington. So he's, he goes up and he's surprised you know, that oh, Billy Graham sees him, brings him up on the stage uh, and, you know, I, and invites him to be part of the service. And, and he's thinking, you know, we, we're not in agreement here on certain things. And Billy Graham begins to share with him afterwards how he'd gone to one of his services and, and Oral Roberts didn't know and had gone with his grandmother and his grandmother was ill and was healed in a Billy Graham, in an Oral Roberts service. And they would become phenomenal partners and, and Oral Roberts would later say regarding Billy Graham that he was able to minister Christ to me more than any other man. Uh, you know, we truly need those key people. So Oral Roberts had a team of people behind him and every great ministry needs a critical team. And then those relationships that can really pour into, bless us and encourage us at the right time. And Oral Roberts did have that. Well, then Oral Roberts would go to Amarillo, Texas. And at that event, a storm comes. And it, they've just bought a brand new tent that can hold, I believe it was like six or 7,000 people. And it's destroyed. And it's a miracle that nobody was hurt. And they I really appreciate the ministry of angels at that event. And Oral Roberts is forced to buy a bigger tent. He buys a tent not going to hold 10,000. Um, he now also looks at, in the early 50s, televising his crusades because he wants to bring 
right to the dinner table what's happening in this crusade. It's not just the message preached, but it, the actual healing component of the service. Uh, so people could see people being healed. And he started to see people, you know, get dramatically healed through the televised crusades. He wasn't the first person to start it, but he really launched in many ways, you know, televangelism and taking the healing ministry on television. Uh, so it takes the right to the people and people start writing in that are dramatically and incredibly healed. You know, one of the people um, in his crusades, just so you understand, Oral Roberts, he goes and his guy has got cancer and they're praying for large numbers of people. And he meets this person and there's a stench and there's just, he's just overcome by the stench and everything else. And it repulses him and he turns around and he goes out of the tent. And the Lord would rebuke him. And really it's a, that this man represented, you know, the people. And he starts to see this man through the eyes of Jesus. The Lord said, if you don't go in there, you're not worthy to be counted a Christian. And he goes back in and prays and it really is a demonstration in him of the burden of the Lord. And that we're not to see people by the outward man, but by the inward love of the Lord. And that really defines old Robert. He truly was broken for the people. Now, another thing I want to share with you, you know, when he was pastoring, was his, his, his wife, a friend, said to him, you know, you know, either you get me a house or I'm going back to his, my mother's. And Oral Roberts would learn another valuable lesson in that time period where they, he's like seeking how I'm going to come out with a deposit for the house. And every step in, in Oral Roberts' life, God is calling him to the impossible. It's always a stretch and a step further that's beyond his natural ability. And so he, he calls the church and, you know, he tells them how they're going to sow seed. And he puts his, all his salary in, and trusting that God is going to meet the down payment for the house. Well, they end up short. And he goes home the night, tells his wife, and his wife's really upset because that was their money for food and everything else, and they don't have it. But in the middle of the night, this farmer knocks at the door and says, you know what, my, house, my farm is in foreclosure, and I had hidden this money in the field, and the Lord convicted me, and I... And even though it's the middle of the night, I have to bring it to you. And of course, it was the amount necessary. And he began to understand, explain, you know, I'm a farmer and I know how to sow. And I want to sow into you for God to bring my breakthrough. And Oral Roberts discovered the importance of seed faith. And he would also understand the importance of, you know, that God didn't want people in poverty. That, so he started to understand the, the, the message of prosperity that he would preach was that God wanted to meet all of your needs and a little more so that you were able to do the will and purpose of the Lord. Um, it wasn't about things and buying bigger things. It was about being free from the bondage of poverty that he knew in his life. Now, another thing that Old Roberts discovered was the point of contact. You know, as he was praying for people, one of the things he discovered was that God began to put this heat and fire and anointing of the presence in his arm. And he would call people to do things because it wasn't just believing. They had to release their faith. Just as you turn a faucet on to release the water, there had to be a stepping forward and releasing of your faith. And he also said understood the importance of the anointing. He wouldn't do something until he understood and, and recognized the presence and the anointing of God there. Uh, before he would minister. He'd wait. He would simply wait. And you see throughout his life, he spent a lot of time in prayer waiting on God. And when he felt that anointing, that's when he began to pray over people. Uh, and the same with the television. And when he asked them to do something as a demonstration of releasing your faith to receive your healing. So these are the principles that he would continue throughout the rest of his ministry uh, that he learned. As I said, they were real to him because he lived them out. So...
as we go throughout the 50s, of course, um, in 54, he would go to Australia. He starts off in Sydney and, you know, they've heard of him and he has a pretty good meeting. And then he goes to Melbourne and things quickly go downhill. Melbourne was not good. He is initially attacked by the press. Uh, the Communist Party raised up people, hoodlins that come to the service and stop everything. Um, and, and then his life is threatened and attacked. I mean, it was just a very bad period and he's forced to flee. And Billy Graham will go there afterwards and had a great time and I actually wrote him a letter, you know, following it. Well, in 59, Oral Roberts is at a full gospel business meeting and um, or he doesn't know this, but Billy Graham is in the same hotel. And Billy Graham discovers and says, you know, send uh, somebody down there and bang Oral Roberts up. I want to meet with him. And Oral Roberts is offended, does not want to go up. And, and finally, through persuasion, you know, they connect. And it becomes a great time where Oral, Billy Graham is able to bless and minister to Oral Roberts, um, you know, because what could have been an an opportunity for the enemy to paralyze and sting him and get hurt and bitterness in him, God was able to minister to and deliver Oral Roberts. Well, as we start to go into the 60s, you know, Oral Roberts started to understand there was a shift occurring and that the Crusades were now starting to decline as the healing revival was beginning to phase out. And God began to speak to him um, regarding building him a university. He would go and he saw this um, piece of land and him and his family would be praying about it for quite some time. And he met in 1960, Pat Robertson of the 700 Club. And he begins to write down something on, a, on this piece of paper. As the Lord reveals to him, I want you to go and build a university. And it's a real message because his son would go to Stanford University and experience the same persecution that he had when he was going to school. Uh, Nora Roberts would actually go to Stanford and preach. And it actually made it worse for his son, Ronnie. And Or Roberts feels led to build up something that will raise up the next generation of people to preach the gospel and take the gospel into every aspect of life, including the marketplace. It's going to be a place where they're going to thrive in excellence and not just spiritually, but physically uh, and in all areas so that, you know, people would have to be a part of an athletic thing so that they were, again, made physically fit uh, as well. And they would have to learn how to pray. Prayer would be the center of this organization they were going to build. Uh, and of course the word. So Or Roberts shares his vision with his team. You know, he's got this team behind him and everybody says, no, you're crazy. Absolutely not. And they're ready to walk out on him. And you can imagine sometimes you know, God puts a vision in you and shares, but somehow forgets to tell the people around you. And Or Roberts has to just plead with them, share with them until God moves on them and, and, and finally they come back in alignment with them. And of course, the next challenge was, where's the money going to come from? And God had to show Oral Roberts as he sought and prayed about it that everything, you know, all the impossibilities that you've come through and that God started the whole universe out of nothing. That you have nothing, go forth in faith and trust Him. So Oral Roberts, uh, as I said, he started the um, Healing Water magazine. He'd gone to Abundant Life. He now begins a partnership program and so people can begin to help him uh, and stand with him. He starts to share the vision of building the school. And it took a lot of work. It took a lot of time for them to build. And it would ultimately not be dedicated until 1967 on April. Uh, it's interesting. Billy Graham was the one invited to dedicate. And at the time, it was very windy. And Billy Graham said, you know, is it always windy like this? And Oral Roberts said, no, sometimes it's windier. Um, you know, but it really shared the story of, of Oral Roberts. This, he was a pioneering person that despite every obstacle, how the wind that would you know, push against him. He never allowed it to stop him. He was once asked um, regarding the healing ministry, did he get concerned about failing? And he said, you know what? If I focused on failing, I would never go into ministry because he realized that, you know, he prayed over a lot of people and most people were healed, but some people didn't and he didn't understand it. But the Lord showed him he was called to simply be obedient and faithful He's not the healer. He's not the savior. And it's not his, his thing to be concerned about the results, but to keep pressing on and simply do. Uh, so he did. He just kept going.
He also starts a TV show. Now he switches because of the crusades are turned on and he starts this show. Uh, and in this show, he would begin to invite um, various celebrities on it. And he uses, and he actually, one of the things that you see that Oral Roberts was strongly against was the race issue. Uh, and one of his crusades where he'd been down south, they had segregation and he was opposed to it. He didn't like this, this whole thing of segregation. Uh, and he really prayed about how I'm gonna deal with this. And you know, the blacks and whites were not allowed to mix. So he determined, you know what, I can't overcome this law of segregation, but at the altar, I will not allow it. And so at the altar, there was a mix and it really offended. He lost a lot of supporters over it, but Oral Roberts made a stand on it. And then he refused to go back and receive an invitation anywhere that they had segregation because he would not allow segregation in his crusades. And in the organization he was building, Oral Roberts University, he would not allow segregation. It would be open for all because he saw that Christ died for all and he was broken for all. Not a matter of your color of your, or anything else. It was Christ was there for all. Uh, so you see that in the burden of Oral Roberts. So they began construction, uh, construction. The buildings continue, I think, from 65 through 75, adding more and more buildings. And the center, of course, is prayer. Uh, they build a big prayer hall, uh, which is 200 feet high, because that's going to be the, the foundation of everything. Uh, also, in 1968, and it was just highly in 1968, Oral Roberts would leave the Pentecostal Holiness Movement. Well, that would come over really well. Many of his staff members, you know, left. They saw it as a compromise. Many of his um, supporters, the full gospel supporters, you know, suddenly turned on him and thought he was compromised because he left and he joined the Methodist Church. And part of it, Or Roberts wanted a organization, a university that was open, um, inclusive to all denominations. This time period, we're also seeing, of course, the rise of the charismatic renewal. And he wanted to see all coming in and receiving the gospel. So as I said, you know, then he had, of course, the death of his daughter. Um, the 70s proved a difficult time period where, you know, his son, uh, Richard, uh, he got married and his wife, uh, really, they, they were at odds. And um, even Catherine Coleman tried to minister to Richard and his wife, Patty. But ultimately she would divorce and she writes a scandalous book uh, against the, the Roberts, really claiming that a lot of things were going on behind the scenes. Uh, his son, Ronnie, would, you know, go into deep rebellion, get caught up in drugs, end up being divorced, um, and, and just come to this place where he doesn't see himself able to get set free and ultimately commit suicide. And it's a heartbreak. So Oral Roberts went through a lot of difficult situations as he pressed on. In the midst of it, he just kept believing God. Uh, I kept praying for his family, trusting God, if I serve you, somehow you're going to take care of my children. You're going to minister to my children. But you got to understand that he's traveling a lot. He's consumed a lot by the ministry. Uh, and it's something we really got to work on. How do you balance and so that we keep and pour and protect our children so they're not lost? And we got to recognize what they're facing and fighting and be there. And it, it is a challenge. Well, during this time, he also feels led to expand and add uh, a medical college, a hospital, and a dentistry school. It would suffer severe challenges because number one, they had to overcome and prove that there was a need for another hospital in Tulsa. Uh, and then they had to get all these approvals and such like that. And so it takes several years and, until finally they were able to get the hospital, I think it was around 1982, the hospital was finally finished. But even from the get-go, the hospital never was fully filled. I think it was only like a third filled. Uh, and it started very quickly to accrue debt, that the medical school and the dentistry school. So by 1986, they have like an $8 million debt. So it was a massive strain on the Oral Roberts uh, organization. Um, and Oral Roberts, you know, he's seeking the Lord. Now, he hears at the beginning of 1986, the Lord speak to him and say to him, you have until March 31st to raise the $8 million or I'm taking you home. Well, he's a 69-year-old man, and you know the way Roberts interpreted it based on his passion, the way he was driven, um, was different than many other people that saw that God was going to kill him. And that's not really what Roberts was saying, but he saw it as the end of you know his ministry. So O. Roberts, you know, says this. He shares this, of course, uh, this controversial thing. And over the next 30, sorry, three months, um, he begins to raise the money. And by the end of March, they are he believes 1.6 million, I believe, shy. And he's on a television show and he's sharing it. And his wife, Evelyn, of course, would, you know, correct him from the audience. 
And he said, oh, yeah, she's right. I think it was 1.3 million. Well, there's a man who wasn't a believer heard that, and he's so moved by that the fact that Oral Roberts was humble enough to receive a correction from his wife on a live show, that he said, I want to pay the remain, remaining amount. And of course, initially they think this guy's a jokester, but finally they do receive it, and the man did pay it. So Oral Roberts did raise the correct amount, and so finally they are no longer in debt. But shortly afterwards, the Jim Baker PTL scandal would arise. Uh, and then in 1987, we would see, of course, the Jimmy Swaggart um, controversy that caused funding, uh, you know, giving towards ministries to drop dramatically. So what happened again, of course, is that Oral Roberts University would start going back into debt uh, based on the, the medical school, the hospital, the City of Hope Hospital, and the dentistry school. So he closes the dentistry school down, I believe, in 87. And then finally in 89, much to his heartache, he's forced to close um, the City of Hope Hospital and the medical school. And he's really broken by it. And, uh, you know, somebody had to minister him, just like Ken Hagen had to minister to him regarding his son Ronnie, that he was not in his right mind and that there's a place where we're handed over for the destruction of our flesh, flesh for the saving of our soul. And that the Lord got a message to him that, you know, the Lord was pleased with him that he fulfilled the purpose in doing what he was supposed to do. Well, Oral Roberts, um, as we go into the 90s, he would hand over the leadership of Oral Roberts University to Richard Roberts now, who is remarried to Lindsay. And his oldest daughter now, um, Roberta, he did not believe in women in leadership. And even though she was a powerful lady, a lawyer, and probably would have been better fit, and he probably would have been better to have given uh, Richard leadership over the medical school and stuff like that, you know, Roberts gave it to Richard. And as we go forward into 2000, 2007, I believe he was forced to resign due to um, lawsuits against him for misusing funds. And Billy Joe Doherty was actually then instated as the head of the university. Well, in 2005, um, Evelyn would pass away. Um, and then in 2007, as I said, there's a change in leadership. Uh, in 2009, and in November, Billy Joe Doherty would die. Uh, and then there was a wedding that Oral Roberts did. But finally in December, at the age of 91, and I consider, I believe it's 92 years from the time his mother dedicated him uh, while he was in the womb, Oral Roberts was promoted to heaven. As we look at his life in ministry, he was a man who was a pioneer. He had to plow against the grain uh, and break open a field. He truly was a history maker uh, that brought a now word in season of correction, a now word of the healing ministry, uh, and, and really help people understand the importance of seed faith, uh, point in contact uh, regarding receiving your healing. He was a true blessing to the body, blessed that generation. Roberta Roberts would write a book about him and explain that not everything he did did people understand, and some of it was kind of um, strange and controversial. But behind the scenes, he was truly sincere. And he had truly had a heart for the people. He lived through a lot of stuff. He lived through sickness. He lived through poverty. And it really changed him when he discovered that God did not, it was not his will for you to walk bound in poverty, bound in sickness, just as it was not his will for you to be bound by sin. And so Oral Roberts brought a message that he understood, that he had, he could see. It was his revelation how we saw the Lord as the Lord, your Savior, your healer, and your provider. He turned and said, you know, that you're not successful unless you have successors. Or Roberts would raise up the next generation, leaders that would take the message of the gospel, as I've said, into the world and into the various areas of business. Many, many great people, ministries have come out of Or Roberts University, and it continues today to raise up the next generation. As I said, Or Roberts understood the importance of shifting when the Spirit of God moved, whether it was into the healing movement or whether it was into the teaching movement. As God began to restore to the church and understand that the Lord was our healer, but then wanted us to understand how we didn't need to go to somebody to get healed, how we could learn to walk by faith and receive our healing, how we needed to be edif ed uh, built up and, and know how to walk out the Word. Or Roberts, as I said, was a great blessing. And I pray that his life and ministry would bless you 
and provoke you. He was controversial, but many history makers and pioneers are. But behind the scenes, he was a man that sought after the Lord, understood the importance of waiting and the importance of the presence and the anointing of God. The Lord used him and took him from the middle of nowhere, a nobody from the middle of nowhere, and changed history. God is no respecter of persons. If God can use Oral Roberts, God can use you. If you'll simply step up in obedience, learn to be led by the Spirit of God, and move out, move forward with the purpose that God's put in you, and, and just allow the Holy Ghost to lead you, even to face the impossible, God will do something bigger in and through you than you can ever imagine. Amen? It's time, as Oral Roberts would say, turn your faith loose in Jesus' name. Thank you.